Over the last 400 years, science has pushed back the limits of what we know, from the largest spiral galaxies to the smallest subatomic particles. As human beings, we are born with senses that allow us to explore the world in which we live. But although our senses shine a light on our immediate environment, they also place a fundamental limit on what can be directly experienced. The unaided eye can see a droplet of water on a leaf, but it is unable to see the trillions of tiny water molecules comprising the droplet, or the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus of each atom. Modern science has allowed us to expand the range of our senses through the use of technology, allowing us to probe ever smaller structures, revealing the rich and detailed tapestry of the microcosmos. History has shown us that the deeper we probe, the more we tend to discover. But is there a limit to how deep we can go? Is there a fundamental lower limit to the size that an object or region of space can be? And if so, can we calculate it? To answer this question, we will begin by considering something seemingly unrelated, a pair of electrons. As you know, electrons are the negatively charged fundamental particles that we find whizzing around inside every atom. What happens if you try to squeeze two electrons closer and closer together? To answer this question, let us consider two electrons separated by some distance r. Now what are the forces acting on these two electrons? Well, firstly we know that because the two electrons have mass, there will be a gravitational force of attraction between them trying to pull them closer together. We also know that because the two electrons are negatively charged, there will be an electrostatic force of repulsion trying to push them apart. Now it is instructive at this stage to consider which of these two forces is greater, the electrostatic force of repulsion or the gravitational force of attraction. The gravitational force between the two electrons can be calculated using Newton's universal law of gravitation, which simply says that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. The constant of proportionality, big G, is known as Newton's gravitational constant. In our example, both m1 and m2 are simply equal to the mass of the electron, which we will simply call m. And so we can write f equals g m squared over r squared. What about the electrostatic force? To calculate this, we make use of Coulomb's law, which states that the force between two charged particles is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. In this case, the constant of proportionality involves epsilon naught, which is known as the permittivity of free space. In the example of two electrons, both Q1 and Q2 are simply equal to E, the charge of the electron, and so we can write F equals E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Let's now calculate the ratio of these two forces to see which is larger. If we sub in the two force expressions and simplify, we find that the ratio of electric to gravitational forces is given by E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught gm squared. The first thing we notice is that the distance between the two electrons, r, cancels, implying that no matter what the separation, the ratio of the two forces should always be the same. This can ultimately be traced back to the fact that these two forces both obey inverse square law relationships. So let's now plug in the numbers and see what we get. When the dust settles, we find the following incredible result. We see that the electrostatic force is 10 to the power of 42 times stronger than the gravitational force. That is a 1 followed by 42 zeros. If you're not impressed, try writing it out. That is a hell of a lot of zeros. This simple calculation is telling us that the gravitational force is incredibly weak compared to the electrostatic force. And yet, it was the gravitational force that was discovered first. But why? Well, the simple answer is that most atoms are electrically neutral, meaning that the positively charged protons are cancelled by the negatively charged electrons. This means that once you're outside the atom, the atom as a whole appears neutral and we just don't notice the incredibly strong electric forces that are being perfectly neutralised inside. Gravity, on the other hand, is different. As far as we can tell, there is no such thing as negative mass, 
and therefore gravitational forces between masses are always attractive. There is nothing to cancel the force of gravity, and therefore we are able to observe its action, despite its incredible weakness, over large distance scales. This simple fact about the attractive nature of gravity leads to the condensation of large gas clouds in space and the subsequent formation of stars and galaxies. These stars then create elements, and some of those stars explode to form the next generation of stars with orbiting planets. And on at least one of those planets, life has evolved. So despite the incredible weakness of the gravitational force, it plays a fundamental role in our personal lives, as well as being responsible for the large-scale structure of the universe. Our analysis would also suggest that the ratio of these two forces is independent of the separation of the two electrons. But as is often the case in fundamental physics, things are not quite as simple as they first appear. One thing that we have not yet taken into account is quantum mechanics. And one very important lesson learned from quantum mechanics is that the classical laws of physics start misbehaving when we probe nature on smaller and smaller scales. More specifically, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that as we squeeze the two electrons into an ever smaller region of space, the laws of quantum mechanics kick into action, causing an inherent quantum jitter in the motion of the two electrons. The smaller the region of space, the greater the quantum mechanical jittering. This jittery motion in turn increases the energy of the two electrons, and at some stage this quantum mechanical energy becomes comparable to the mass energy required to create a new electron. Now this might sound crazy, but Einstein showed that energy can be converted into mass, and vice versa, and the energy required to do this can be calculated relatively easily using Einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared. And we can actually figure out the distance at which this happens by combining Einstein's famous equation with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So let's now do that. In essence, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that if we confine an object to a region of space of size delta x, then the uncertainty in the momentum of the object must be roughly greater than h-bar divided by delta x, where h-bar is a tiny number referred to as the reduced Planck's constant. If we consider our two electron system separated by a distance r, then we can assume for our purpose that delta x is equal to r, and we can write delta p must be roughly greater than or equal to h bar over r. Now clearly, if the two electrons gain momentum, it follows that they must also gain energy, and we can indeed rewrite the uncertainty relation in terms of energy by multiplying both sides of this expression by the speed of light. You can check with a simple calculation that the units of momentum times velocity are indeed equivalent to the units of energy. Thus we see from this expression that as r decreases, delta e increases, and this represents the quantum mechanical jittery energy that was alluded to earlier. Now we wish to estimate the value of r which corresponds to a value of delta e, which is comparable to the energy required to create the mass of an electron. According to Einstein's special theory of relativity, the energy required to create the mass of an electron is simply given by the mass of the electron multiplied by the speed of light squared. And so we see that by combining our expression for delta E with Einstein's famous equation, we arrive at the following expression for R. If we plug in the numbers, we find a number of order 10 to the minus 13 metres which to provide some context is smaller than a typical atom, which is roughly 10 to the minus 10 metres, but not quite as small as the nucleus, which is of order 10 to the minus 15 metres. So what is this telling us? This is simply saying that as we squeeze the two electrons closer together, when the separation gets smaller than roughly 10 to the minus 13 metres, then quantum mechanical uncertainty becomes significant enough to cause the creation of mass. We've now crossed over into a region in which both the laws of quantum mechanics and the laws of relativity become important. So the natural question to then ask is what happens if we continue pushing the two electrons even closer together still? Well, we have already seen that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that as delta x gets smaller, delta e will get larger. And Einstein tells us that this is equivalent to adding more mass to our system. And because gravity talks to mass, the strength of the gravitational force will also start to increase. 
and therefore our ratio of forces will no longer remain at 10 to the power of 42. As the electrons are squeezed closer and closer together, the gravitational force will get relatively stronger and the ratio will start decreasing. So the next question that we need to ask is at what separation will this ratio become equal to 1? In other words, at what distance scale will the gravitational force become comparable to the electrostatic force such that the ratio of the two forces becomes equal to 1? Well, we should be able to calculate this. If we look at the expression for the ratio of the electric and gravitational forces, then we can estimate the mass required to make this ratio equal to 1. Rearranging for m, we find the following expression. And this mass value can then be converted into an energy value, which we can then plug into the uncertainty principle to tell us at what length scale this will occur. Simple. When the dust settles, we see that the two electrons would need to be squeezed to an incredibly small separation distance of roughly 10 to the minus 34 metres for the two forces to become comparable. So the natural question to ask is, what happens if we squeeze the electrons even closer still? Well, you guessed it, the gravitational force will continue to increase. But can this increase continue forever? Well, it turns out that the answer is no. Nature conspires to place a fundamental limit on how close we can squeeze the two electrons together, and it does so by invoking the general theory of relativity and one of nature's most mysterious objects, a black hole. In order to understand how this happens, we need to take a brief detour and understand how and why a black hole might form in the first place. Consider a small mass which we will call little m, located at the surface of a larger mass, big M. Now clearly there is a gravitational force of attraction between these two masses, and therefore if I want to pull the small mass away from the surface of the larger mass, I will need to do some work to overcome the attractive force of gravity. If I move the small mass through some small distance dr, then the work required to do this, dw, is simply equal to the force, f, multiplied by the distance, dr. What if I wanted to calculate how much work is required to pull the small mass away from the surface of the big mass and move it all the way to infinity? Well, in that case, we would need to use calculus since the magnitude of the force changes with distance, and therefore we would have to integrate f times dr from r to infinity, which we can write as w equals the integral of g big M little m over r squared dr. If we integrate with respect to r, we find the following expression. And if we then sub in the limits of the integral, we find that the total work done is equal to gmm over r. Now it should hopefully be clear that as little m is moved away from big M, little m will gain potential energy, and that the total gain in potential energy will simply be equal to the total work done. Armed with this useful piece of information, we can now ask the question, how fast would I have to throw little m such that it escaped the gravitational attraction of big M? This is equivalent to asking at what velocity would I need to throw little m so that it travels an infinite distance from big M? Well, we can answer this question because we have just seen how much energy is required to achieve this, namely g big M little m over r. If we are able to launch our little m with an initial amount of kinetic energy equal to this, then it will escape the gravitational field of big M and tend to infinity. To calculate the velocity required to achieve this, we simply equate the kinetic energy with the potential energy and write half mv squared equals g big M little m over r. If we then rearrange for v, we find that v equals the square root of 2g big M over r. This velocity is referred to as the escape velocity of big M. As a point of reference, if we sub in the mass and radius of planet Earth, we find that the escape velocity is approximately 11 kilometers per second. Whereas if we do the same for Jupiter, we find a value of roughly 60 kilometers per second. We see from the equation for escape velocity that there are two contributing factors which determine the escape velocity of an object, namely the mass and the radius. The more massive an object, the stronger the gravitational force on the surface, and therefore the greater the escape velocity. But we also see that if a given mass is squeezed into an ever smaller radius, this too will increase the escape velocity, 
In other words, the more dense an object is, the greater the escape velocity. So a natural question arises, what would happen if an object was so dense that the escape velocity from the surface of the object was greater than the speed of light? Well, in that case, not even light could escape the object, and so it would appear black. An object of such high density, from which not even light can escape, is called a black hole. We can see the condition necessary for this to happen by looking at the escape velocity equation and by replacing the escape velocity with the speed of light. If we then rearrange this expression for r, we find that r equals 2gm over c squared. This radius is known as the Schwarzschild radius, and it tells us how small we would have to squeeze an object of mass m in order for it to collapse to form a black hole. So what does this have to do with squeezing together two electrons? Well, if you recall, as we squeeze the two electrons closer and closer together, the mass of our system increases due to the uncertainty principle and Einstein's theory of special relativity. So hopefully you can see where this is going. If we keep squeezing the electrons into a smaller and smaller volume of space, and in doing so we increase the amount of mass contained within that space, then at some stage we will cross a threshold where a black hole will form. And we can calculate when this will happen. We just need to combine all of our results so far. So let's do that. We have already seen that the combination of quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of special relativity allows us to estimate how much gravitational mass m is contained within our electron system when the separation is r. And we've also just seen how the Schwarzschild radius is related to the gravitational mass. Well, if we now combine these two equations by eliminating m, we should be able to determine the length scale at which a black hole will form. We see that this occurs when r is roughly equal to the square root of g h bar over c cubed. And if we put in the numbers, we find a value of roughly 10 to the minus 35 metres. In other words, if we squeeze our two electrons into a volume of space roughly equal to 10 to the minus 35 metres, then a black hole will form. So we find a situation in which we are trying to figure out what is going on inside this region of space at higher and higher energies, but in doing so, the uncertainty principle forces so much mass into the region we are trying to look at that it collapses to form a black hole. And at this point, you can't get any information out. So you might consider using even more energy, but that would simply make a bigger black hole, which would make the situation even worse. What this means is that there is no operational way of probing nature at distances smaller than this. This length, which we have just uncovered, is known as the Planck length and represents a fundamental lower limit to our knowledge of space and the distance scales at which we can meaningfully probe nature. And it is interesting to note that this limitation in our knowledge is unveiled at length scales where quantum mechanics, relativity and gravity all become equally important. Now at this stage we can also calculate how much mass must be squeezed into this minuscule volume in order for the black hole to form. We simply rearrange the equation for the Schwarzschild radius and find that m is roughly equal to the square root of Planck's constant multiplied by the speed of light divided by the gravitational constant. This mass is referred to as the Planck mass and has a value of roughly 22 micrograms which is roughly the mass of a flea egg. So it is rather fascinating to reflect that the fundamental limit of space itself is revealed by squeezing a flea egg's worth of mass into a space of length 10 to the minus 35 metres, causing the formation of a black hole. Who would have thought? Now you might be justified in thinking that this has all been a bit hand-wavy and imprecise, but I can assure you that these are exactly the kind of thought experiments that theoretical physicists consider when trying to understand the need for a new quantum theory of gravity. But I also think it would be illustrative to show you how we can arrive at the same result from a slightly different perspective. So let's now do that. When theoretical physicists think about the fundamental laws of nature, there are three broad theories that spring to mind. Firstly, you have quantum mechanics, which helps us to describe the microscopic universe. Then there is Einstein's theory of special relativity, which helps us to describe fast-moving objects, as well as the relationship between mass and energy. And then there is gravity, which, as already discussed, plays an important role in the large-scale structure of the universe. 
Now, what is interesting is that each of these broad theories contains a fundamental constant of nature. In quantum mechanics, the fundamental constant is Planck's constant, h-bar, which appears as the conversion factor between energy and frequency. In relativity, the constant is the speed of light, c. And in gravity, we have Newton's gravitational constant, big G. One question we might want to ask is, what are the fundamental base units of h-bar, c and g? To answer this, we will need to take a slight detour into the world of units. As you may know, most quantities in physics can be expressed in terms of seven base units. The most commonly known are the units for length, time and mass, namely the metre, second and kilogram. We also have the ampere, mole, candela and kelvin, although we will not be needing to refer to these in what follows. In order to determine the units of a quantity, we often refer to the equation which defines the quantity. For example, to determine the units of speed, we simply refer to the equation speed equals distance over time, and that tells us that the units of speed are the units of distance divided by the units of time, in other words, metres per second. Likewise, the equation for acceleration tells us that the units of acceleration are metres per second squared. So what about h-bar, g and c? Well, let's first of all deal with the easy one. The speed of light clearly has units of metres per second, since it represents a speed. What about Planck's constant? Well, if we look at the defining equation, then we see that h-bar has units of energy divided by frequency. And we know that frequency has units of seconds to the minus one. So what about energy? We can determine the base units of energy by referring to the equation for work done, which equals force times distance. And we can determine the units of force by referring to Newton's famous second law, F equals ma. Mass has units of kilograms and acceleration has units of metres per second squared, and so force has units of kilogram metres per second squared. And therefore we can work out that energy has units of kilogram metres squared per second squared. And if we put all of this together, we see that h-bar has units of kilogram metres squared s to the minus 1. So what about Newton's gravitational constant? We can figure this out by rearranging the gravitational force equation for g. We then see that the units of g are equal to the units of force times distance squared divided by the mass squared. Using the units for force that we have already established, we find that the units of g simplify to kilograms to the minus 1 meters cubed seconds to the minus 2. So we have succeeded in expressing each of these fundamental constants in terms of the base SI units of kilograms, metres and seconds. Now at this stage we might ask a question that Max Planck asked himself over 100 years ago. Is it possible to combine these three fundamental constants in such a way as to produce a new quantity with units of length? Since it was Max Planck who first asked this question, and since it is a unit of length that we are trying to construct, we will call this length the Planck length. The trick to solving this problem is to write our proposed Planck length as some power of g multiplied by some power of h-bar multiplied by some power of c. Our task is to then determine what the powers alpha, beta and gamma must be so as to ensure that the combination of units simplifies to units of metres only. So how do we do this? We simply substitute the units of each of these quantities and write a new equation in terms of the units only. We want the units on both sides of this expression to be equal to the unit of length. If we then use the rule of exponents to simplify the right hand side, we arrive at the following expression. What we now want to do is match the left and right hand sides. In order to make this clear, I will rewrite the left hand side in a completely equivalent form as kilograms to the power 0, m to the power 1, s to the power 0. Clearly this is no different to what I had before, because any number raised to the power 0 is simply 1. But now our strategy becomes crystal clear. All we need to do is match the exponents on the left hand side and right hand side to ensure that the exponents of each unit match. This leads to a set of three simultaneous equations which we can simply solve. The first tells us that alpha equals beta, and we can then combine the second two equations to find that alpha and beta both equal half, and gamma equals minus three halves. 
So if we then put this back into our original expression for the proposed Planck length, we find the following familiar expression that we arrived at earlier by considering the electron black hole argument. Armed with our new unit-based approach, there is no need to stop at the Planck length. We can play the same game of dimensional analysis to construct other Planckian quantities, including the Planck mass and Planck time. We have already encountered the Planck mass, but what about the Planck time? Can we give meaning to this quantity? Well, the first thing we notice when we plug in the numbers is that the Planck time is incredibly small, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So what does this time represent? Well, in its simplest sense, the Planck time tells us how long it will take light to travel a length equal to the Planck length. But this doesn't shine much light on the matter. Is there another interpretation? Well, in Big Bang cosmology, the Planck epoch, or Planck era, is the earliest stage of the universe's history, less than 10 to the minus 44 seconds after the Big Bang. There is no currently available physical theory to describe such short times, and it is not clear in what sense the concept of time is meaningful for values smaller than the Planck time. It is generally assumed that quantum effects of gravity dominate physical interactions at this timescale. People often ask, what happened before the Big Bang? But the truth is, we hit an issue before we even get to the Big Bang, at 10 to the minus 44 seconds, where we no longer have any operational meaning of time, let alone before the Big Bang. Now at this point, you could take one of two attitudes. Firstly, that space and time are real, that they are actually there, but that we just can't measure them at these extreme length and time scales. The other approach is to say that there is no such thing as space-time at arbitrarily short distance scales, and a new approach is required. One idea is to suggest that there are atoms of space-time, and when we get down to the scale of these atoms, space-time stops looking like space-time, in much the same way that a wooden table stops looking like a wooden table at the atomic dimension of carbon. The problem with this perspective is that when you ask in whose reference frame is the space-time atomic dimension 10 to the minus 35 metres, it is very difficult to make sense of this perspective because of relativity. In fact, it is incredibly difficult to come up with a concept of discreteness of space-time in a way that is consistent with the laws of special relativity. And the theoretical physicists who pursue this direction are happy to abandon special relativity. The truth of the matter is that at the moment we just don't know what happens at these extreme length and time scales, other than the fact that a new theory of quantum gravity is most likely required. Perhaps somebody watching this video may feel inspired to take on the challenge. So remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And however difficult life may seem, there is always something that you can do and exceed at. It matters that you just don't give up. Unleash your imagination. Shape the future.